everyone. My name is Kira Simone Shepard. I'm a graduating senior from Fort Lauderdale, Florida, and I attend Florida Agricultural and Mechanical University. My research project was on the meat gene insertion into Vetus rotundifolia embryogenic cell cultures. At FAMU, some great things are happening every single day. At our Center for Viticulture and Small Fruit Research, we're starting to see a pretty interesting trend as it pertains to the farmers and growers in Florida. They're starting to grow more grapes, muscadine grapes to be exact. These grapes are shown to be a more alter an alternative source of uh, crops that planters are starting to like. And these are interesting because they have a phenolic content that is of interest to us. They have an uh, increased potential of <coughs> nutraceutical value as well as functional food value. Next slide, please. Now, these muscadine grapes have been shown to have antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-cancerous, even anti-aging properties. And so they're posed to become a new crash cash crop in Florida, not only because they are shown to be a functional food, but because they're a potent source of nutraceuticals and plant derivatives that can go on to become medications or different extracts that people can take every day. Next slide. My objective was to overexpress the anthocyanin pathway inside of the in vitro embryogenic cell cultures of the Vetus rotunda, rotunda folia. And I used biotechnology methodology in order to accomplish this. Now, normal methodology for plant breeding consists of hybridization, cross-pollination, growing that plant, and then evaluating that plant to see if it took in what you wanted it to take. That isn't necessarily what we do in modern biotechnology. Instead, I use something called agrobacterium, which is a microbe found in soil that causes crown gall disease. This agrobacterium is co-cultivated with my embryogenic callus, which is more like a seed uh, without a seed coat that's held in vitro. And I use that to insert my gene of interest that there's been some sort of study and we know what this gene does. And we did all of that research in health as well. My second objective was to confirm that I achieved my first objective. Next slide, please. So a little bit on the meat gene. This gene, like I said, controls the anthocyanin production in muscadine grape. In this first picture to your left, you see the Darlene variety. That is the variety that I have in embryogenic form. It's a white grape or a colorless grape. That's because the meat gene is not being expressed properly. In the supreme variety, you can see that it has that red color. That red color denotes that that anthocyanin is being accumulated inside of the grape pigment and into the grape skin. And so we know that this meat gene is being expressed properly because the meat gene is shown to be at the bottom of the plant pathway or it's the <coughs> regulatory gene. So that's the gene that tells you uh, or allows the plant to actually make anthocyanin. So at the end of this entire endeavor, we want the Darlene variety to look like the Supreme variety. Next slide, please. In order to accomplish my goal, first I had to learn how to work with somatic embryos. Working in vitro is very difficult. You have to use accepted technique. Um, it's very easy to contaminate. So I spent about a year working on simply accepted technique because these embryos um, were established in-house and they're not very easy to establish. Once I got my technique, however, I was able to prep my embryos for transformation. I put them on a solid media. I went ahead and grew agrobacterial tum agrobacterium tumor fosciens. Now, this bacteria is, uh, it has an ability to insert genes into everything from bacteria to plants to even humans. So I had to be very careful and once again develop that aseptic technique. And when I grew this bacteria, it usually grows very slowly because it has a lot of genetic information. It doesn't grow as fast as something like E. coli or something like that. Um, it grows about two to three days it takes. I had to breed this to grow overnight. So I had to consistently um, put it in fresh media, inoculate until I got it to grow in a 24 hour span so that it could be, uh, uh, it could proliferate <coughs> fast enough to actually deliver my gene of interest without killing my cell culture. My third step was a co-cultivation step. It's a 72 hour process consisting of about 15 different steps. Um, once I co-cultivated my agrobacterium with my cell culture, I went ahead and suppressed my microbial growth of my agrobacterium by putting it on a selective media that contained an antibiotic that this agrobacterium was not resistant for. 
So it was resistant for things like rifampicillin, canamycin, and tetracycline. However, it was not resistant for uh, cefotoxin. And so that's the antibiotic that I decided, well, we decided to use. Next slide, please. Here is a picture of my gel electrophoresis results. But what exactly does that picture mean? It's so uh, dark and arbitrary. Inside of my agrobacterium, there's a, uh, there's a promoter, a gene, and a terminator. That's how genes are expressed inside of uh, humans and organisms. This promoter comes from the cauliflower mosaic virus, and it's termed a 35S promoter. It's a 347 base pair sequence, and this sequence is inside of my agrobacterium. If I'm able to isolate or promote this sequence inside of my bacterial genome or my plant genome, then I know that I was able to deliver the set of genes or the gene that I was attempting to deliver. And so, here's this picture, but labeled. I was able to isolate my whole bacterial genome, extract that DNA, I amplified it using a polymerase chain reaction, which is a PCR. I had a forward and a reverse primer that myself and my advisor put together, which was really cool. I went ahead and amplified that and found these amplicons. I went, once I confirmed that I had my gene inside of my bacteria, I co-cultivated at that point. I extracted my whole plant genome. The DNA ended up staying in the wells because the genome is so big. Um, then I went ahead and amplified using my plant genome as a template again, and I was able to receive the same amplicons that I found in my bacterial genome. And so what that means is I was able to achieve my objective. This table right here shows the nanodrop concentrations. That's at uh, like nanograms per microliter, that's very small. And so you see in wells two, three, and four, that's the whole bacterial genome. You can't really see it, but if you were able to see the picture, you'd know that uh, there was a small fluorescence there. Not as bright as this one, but it can't because it's, it's not as high as concentration. And so, moving forward, some next steps are going to be the formation of a transformed secondary cali. The second step would be the formation of transformed roots and shoots. And then the third step is going to be the regeneration of my callus into a full plant. And so here are my references. And I'd just like to thank the USDA, State of Florida, Florida a and my college, Florida a and College of Agriculture and Food Science, and a special thank you to my dean, Dr. Salova, Dr. <coughs> Nanga, Dr. Sargent, and Manners as a whole. Thank you.